Okay, so can we take some points and questions? Uh, I think we've got a mic going around, and uh, always best to identify yourself as well. Uh, who'd like to kick things off? David Higgins, um, I'm political analyst with Carrick Hill. Uh, you mentioned productivity at the start, um, and while productivity has been strong in France and Germany since EU membership, productivity in the UK generally has been quite weak in the past couple of years. Um, how should the UK try and resolve that and try and improve its productivity? Um, and then you mentioned about um, wages. Um, the UK is now at full employment, despite Brexit. Um, but we haven't seen a significant rise in wages yet in the UK. And of course, yesterday, they lifted the 1% public sector pay cap. But it suggests that there could be further wage pressures in the UK over the coming months. Um, how might they play out? Um, I mean, I, I think, you know, we, productivity in the UK collapsed in, in 2008 and has not recovered really at all. It's, it's a remarkable story to which we do not know the answer of, of what is driving it. Um, you know, it is uh, likely to be some combination of uh, um, stagnant business investment, underinvestment in the, by the public sector, um, in my view, to some extent, uh, constraints on housing and planning. Uh, which make it difficult for people to move where the high productivity jobs are and so on. Uh, uh, and the overhang of, uh, uh, um, in the financial sector, which means that we're still, I suspect the UK banks are still happy, happiest when they're lending to people buying houses and, and the rest of it. Um, but how we deal, I mean, the, the, you know, uh, um, how we deal with that, I think you know, no, no, nobody knows in, in, in the UK. And if I did, <laughs> I would be, uh, uh, um, uh, I would be advising the government. Um, but uh, uh, it, it, it is very much the central economic problem in the UK at the moment for the medium to long term. We have full employment. Uh, we have, but um, it has not been combined with sort of significant advances in productivity, and we are still at a loss. At, as to quite what it is about our economic model that, that is driving that. As I say, my personal view is that the most obvious um, and easiest from an economic perspective set of issues to sort out would be around housing and planning, and to some extent also going along with that, public sector and infrastructure investment. Um, but those have turned out to be quite difficult to deal with politically. Um, on wages, um, uh, it's um, uh, it's true the government has, has lifted the public sector pay cap to a limited extent. Um, whether this reflects widening wage, wage pressures more generally and public sector, you know, whether it will be translated into increases in private sector wages is much less clear at the moment. Um, uh, uh, it's not... Um, you know, and, and, and the government certainly, as of yet, has not made uh, uh, said that it's going to be increasing public sector wages any faster than private sector wages are already increasing. So, as yet, that hasn't happened. It may do, but uh, um, but we've been waiting for wage growth for the UK in a long time. Uh, Ronan Tynan, um, there's just a, I, you seem remarkably uh, optimistic in, in my view, but there's just there's just a question to the econometric models because the two variables I think really are very hard to quantify but could be quite significant. Mm. And Fox berated British business for its lack of ambition recently. And he was reflecting, I think, the, rep the panic representation he's getting. And I would argue that's for two reasons. One, if you're a UK company focusing on the French market, yeah. and you that becomes uncompetitive, to re-gear in the 21st century where you now can, you have to invest so much in really getting to know your customer, your social media, blah, 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 that to suddenly reorientate which theoretically sounds kind of easy because all social media, blah, blah, but it's actually remarkably difficult because you need a grasp of the culture wherever you go and the investment, the time, like blah, blah, could be catastrophic. So that's the first thing that I question if these models are able to take account of. The second and even more dangerous point for the UK, and the famous lawnmower case study I thought was really brilliant on this, mm. the day after Britain leaves the European Union, say, for example, I control 25% of our market, and I, the Brits, the United Kingdom, control 20%. Well, the first thing I do on, day, on the following day is I will immediately seek to change EU regulations to make UK products uncompetitive. And in the lawnmower case, sorry, all I have to do is just sort of raise the decibel yeah. level or something, and straight away I wipe out the UK lawnmower industry. So in other words, those two key things spell catastrophe for the British economy. 
And you rarely hear them debate it. You do hear them debate, I'm quite sure, the lobby that mm. goes out against Fox. Yeah. Yeah. So how do you quantify that? And how can you be optimistic against that background? Thank you. Um, uh, I mean, those are very good points. And, and, and uh, the answer is, is that it is, you know, it is pretty difficult to quantify. Um, I, I think you, it goes back to the sort of general point, though, of, of um, which way do you think the asymmetry goes? So I had asserted, and you're right, I asserted without backing it up with, with particularly strong evidence, that the gains from integration uh, um, and, and uh, um, trade liberalization and regulatory harmonization between the UK and the EU um, would be greater than the losses resulting from us leaving and, and divergence over time. Um, could, could you write down model, you know, an economic model where that, not only was that not the case, but as you suggested, the reverse might be the case, that the losses from leaving might be even greater than the gains from entry. Um, you could, in principle, it depends exactly, it would depend on how exactly you specified investment, the time arising from the investment costs and sunk costs and so on in your model. I guess my feeling is, is that uh, um, the sort of divergence and the regulatory gaming that you suggest would take quite a long time. You know, it, would it happen? Yes, some of it. But it would take quite a long time, and that time would in itself give UK firms time to readjust in one form or another, whether towards the domestic market or the international market. But you're right. I mean, they, you know, I'm not. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm speculating rather than I. You know, I. The, the, the points you raise are perfectly valid, and we will only find out long after the event. Good. The gentleman down there beside the fireplace. Good afternoon, Thomas Kluge, Deputy Ambassador for the Netherlands. Uh, Mark Price, the former Trade Minister who resigned a fortnight ago, he said in an interview today in The Guardian that two underlying reasons why people voted for Brexit was low wages and uh, the outsourcing. And uh, he says the Brexit doesn't um, affect either of those two reasons. How would you respond to that and could the realization of that play in a role in the current Brexit negotiations? Could what, what was asked? Sorry. If, if that realization that indeed um, those two reasons for voting for Brexit doesn't play a real part or doesn't have a real impact after the Brexit, won't be changed by the Brexit, could it influence the debate on the Brexit actually at the moment? Um, well, I, I mean, I think you, you, you're the, the first half of, of your question is clearly right. As I tried to explain in my introduction, people, you know, the observable correlates of voting Brexit suggested that people voted for Brexit for lots of reasons which had relatively little to do with the European Union at all. And certainly, I think it's, um, you know, uh, uh, it's my view and the view of most economists that, you know, the sort of many of the big, both big structural advantages, but certainly the big structural disadvantages of the UK economy have really got very little to do with the European Union. It's not the European Union, you know, the European Union has some influence around the edges, around things like environmental regulation, certainly, and housing, so, so, and hence housing and planning, and around, say, education and welfare. But those are fundamentally national competences, and if we get them wrong, it's our own fault. Um, and did people vote partly on those grounds? Absolutely. And, 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 you know, and, and, and wage stagnation um, has relatively little to do with, uh, with the EU and quite a lot to do with um, the, the structural issues around the, EU, the UK economy, which, which I then entered the first what that So I agree with that. Um, what that does to the uh, um, uh, political dynamic, though, I think is much less clear, I'm afraid. Um, and here, you know, this is very much more a political science than an economics question. But um, uh, if uh, it seems to me that that if we have a continued period of stagnation of real wages, then people, you know, that, w that will not in itself lead to people changing their mind about Brexit. In order to, you know, people tend, as I understand it, and I'm 
straight into the political science literature, people tend on the whole to fix on evidence that, that confirms their, their previous decisions. So the prejudice among most people, and this is true on the Remain side as well as the Leave side, is to point at news and say, well, this shows that I was right to vote for Remain because it was a disaster, because these disastrous things are happening. Same time, people on the Brexit side point to other bits of news and say, well, this shows clearly that Brexit is going fine. Um, so my view remains that in order to have a proper shift of opinion on this, you will need a set of events which fulfill two characteristics. One, which that they are unidentifiable, that they are, you know, very clearly um, and unarguably associated with Brexit. Um, and second, that they affect directly the, uh, the, the broad groups who voted for Brexit. So as I said, it's not going to be HSBC moving at headquarters. If Nissan or Toyota come out and say at some point, right, we've really had enough of this. Um, you guys do not know what you are doing. We are closing our operations here and we are moving it to Slovakia because, or wherever. Uh, that, that, a, a few decisions like that, it seems to me, would change the tone of the debate quite a lot, but we haven't had anything like that yet. Could you say something just again on the voting and the economic disparities of the voting population? What do you think the effect will be on regionally, on the impact on the British economy? Um, most regions of the UK are dependent on EU trade and EU membership in one form or another, but it's quite different, of course. So London is dependent on uh, um, financial services, whereas uh, the North East is dependent on manufacturing and Nissan and, uh, uh, um, and, and its supply chain. Um, so uh, we don't know ex ante how, what the regional effects will look like because we don't know what, uh, um, we don't know what sort of deal we're going to have and whether it will disproportionately affect manufacturing or services or indeed both. Um, my um, view, but again, this is, this is a hypothesis. Right? You know, so, so there has been a bit of quantitative work on this, the Center for European Reform. I think you had, are you having? We're having next week. We're having next week. Um, produced something showing that actually the regions that voted most for Brexit were likely to be the most adverse affected. But I think, that, in my view, is, you know, is, is useful, but somewhat speculative. We don't know that to be the case because it will depend on, 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 on what sort of deal. I think beyond that, my sense is although London will suffer from uh, uh, any Brexit-related reductions in skilled immigration and Brexit-related increased barriers to services, London is sufficiently dynamic and adaptable, going back to the, the earlier question, that you know, we'll find ways, we'll find new markets or new industries or whatever. That, you know, not that there won't be a cost. Um, whereas if, going back to the previous question, you know, if Nissan or Tata Steel close down, that's really very, very serious for the, uh, for the areas that are affected. And another one in the second row here. <clears throat> Thanks, Paul Levitt. I'm on sabbatical from the Foreign Office. Um, it, it's often said that Britain acquired its empire in a fit of absent mindedness, and it feels sometimes that it's leaving the EU in the same spirit as I said on sabbatical. Um, I wonder if you could say a little bit about how you think the economics might be brought to bear on the what's a very fluid political uh, situation where there's no support for any particular model of leaving or future relationship with, with the EU. So, how does a business or how do the Irish government or whoever bring the economics into play because even even the Chancellor seems to be struggling to do it to some extent. Um. Well, I think it is, um, uh, um, I, I do think it is very difficult. Um, and I think ideally, you know, and, 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 and I worry that it will only come into play as a result either of a, of a breakdown in negotiations or by some sort of major economic event or, or by the former precipitating the latter, which on the one hand, you might say, well, that's a good thing. At least it will force the UK to confront the consequences of this choice. But on the other, you can also see that poisoning the political debate in such a way that we end up in an even worse outcome. Um, I will say sort of what, you know, uh, um, what I think we should do if we could. You know, what would I like to see Theresa May say at this point? And I think what, you know, or, or the government say. And what I think I'd like, you know, in an ideal world, what they would come out and say is, look, we realize that 
we're not going to be able to do um, uh, to establish the framework of our future relationship with the EU within the time available. Um, we therefore need some form of, of as the Chancellor has already said, um, extension period uh, um, or, or you know, interim standstill agreement. During that time, we, the UK, need to have a proper public debate about which of these, you know, what I call the Farage, Fox, or, or, or Hammond, Treasury, Brexit, we want. Once we've done that, we can move forward and, and make the best of whatever it is that we choose. But we need to have that. We need to have the time and space to do that. Um, and to take and to, to consider the economic and social consequences of those choices, um, I don't think, unfortunately, that's what May's speech next week is going to say. Although I don't genuinely don't know what it is going to say. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Tom Hawhey. Just a, a quick question: uh, Prior to Brexit, uh, what level of stimulation to the UK economy uh, would a twenty percent devaluation? have resulted in uh, from the Treasury model and what happened? I mean, I think, you know, we're still arguing in the UK about the extent to which recovery in 1992 to 94 was driven by the devaluation, uh, the, the um, ERM exit and the consequent devaluation as opposed to uh, um, the, uh, the fall in interest rates um, and economic recovery elsewhere. So I think the, the short answer is, is we're not going to resolve that. But I mean, the, the, the broad answer, which I expect the one you're looking for, ha have the results of the de devaluation been quite disappointing so far? Yes, that's clearly true. Um, I suspect we will see some pickup in exports over, you know, we will see ex British exports doing better over the next year or so. Um, but it will be very difficult to attribute that to uh, um, uh, as between uh, um, uh, economic recovery in the eurozone, which obviously helps, and the uh, the direct uh, the direct impact of the devaluation. I think it's pretty clear that it hasn't the, so far. The economy has not responded as much as the treasury model, or indeed the the NISA model, where where I used to work, uh, would have predicted. Um, but it is quite difficult, as you know, to to unpick these things. Thank you, uh, gentleman in the doorway there. Thank you very much, uh, Donald Denham. Uh, coming back to your uh, modeling on Brexit scenarios, um, and you didn't mention perhaps the most important issue, which is the price to be paid for Brexit. Supposing the European Union uh, decide uh, that they're not going to have a deal with Britain, that Brussels will initiate a no deal exit for the UK, Supposing the price is in the hundreds of millions or billions and not just the, the 20 to 40 that gets mentioned in the, in the British media, does that change your modelling? It's following up, I suppose, Mr. Tynan's question of uh, it, your, your uh, supposition so far seem to be based on a very benign European Union. Um. Well, I mean, it's, it's a comp it's, I'm not assuming a benign European Union uh, so much as one that, that pursues enlightened self-interest, um, which on the whole I tend to think the, the EU does. I mean, not, not you know, often crab-wise in, in the usual way of these things. But I don't think, you know, um, a chaotic scenario um, will do significant damage, um, certainly to the Irish economy, um, but also to, uh, um, to the French and German economies. Um, it's clearly not in the EU's interests. Um, and the EU's negotiating guidelines um, do not suggest that they are pursuing, you know, that, they're, that their preferred option is no deal, as opposed to um, their preferred option being a deal where the UK um, has to accept that, uh, um, that some things we will have to give ground on some things and compromise on some things. On some things, we're simply going to have to concede. Um, uh, and particularly on the exit bill, for example, I mean, there's nothing that I've seen, you know, what I've seen suggests that the EU is bidding very much at the high end, but not that the EU is deliberately trying to sabotage the negotiations by coming up with a 
figure that is so high we can't even talk about it if we wanted to, or that it can't be negotiated down to a level which, if if there is a political will in the UK, that that we could live with. And I don't, you know, I think analysts in Brussels and London are reasonably clear that, you know, uh, um, that both the that the both the EU on the one side and the Treasury in London on the other would grudgingly end up being happy with a bill of 30 or 40 billion um, and that if that could be presented at least for the first couple of years as payment just continuing our ongoing budget contributions as part of some interim phase um, you know then then you know every, at, at official level people will be happy now can Theresa May does Theresa May accept that that's the best option for the UK is she then prepared to sell it to her own party and country and to face down people who won't like it? That is unknown. But the fact that, that, that the sort of outline of that deal is there, I think, has been pretty common gossip in, in Brussels and London for, for at least the last three months. You mentioned the costs for Ireland. It's just maybe yeah. worth pointing out that Irish exports to the UK as a percentage of GDP exceed Britain's exports to the 27. Yes. So the, the, the impact for us could actually be greater than, than for the UK. Uh, the very curious second row is back again. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, uh, Oliver Grogan, uh, one time Department of Foreign Affairs. Uh, we had a talk last week on the trade aspects of Brexit. Uh, the speaker, uh, whose name I forget at the moment, um, was quite upbeat on the question of uh, future free trade agreements with, um, uh, on, a, on a bilateral basis that Britain could effect. Um, the, the, the reason for his uh, optimism uh, in his own terms was that uh, um, Britain would no longer be simply part of the negotiating mix of the AU, EU, and would focus on its own strengths and uh, priorities, in particular uh, financial services. Um, now, the discussion left open um, a number of aspects, and maybe you, perhaps you would address uh, one of them, and that is the, um, the negotiating heft that uh, Britain could bring to bear as uh, negotiating on its own as opposed to being part of a continental bloc. Uh, I'm thinking in particular of uh, getting a deal with countries like uh, uh, China, which would perhaps insist on um, access to, uh, uh, for its deal to Britain uh, as a, a, as a uh, counterpart to um, a deal on financial services and similarly with India which would possibly insist on uh, greater openness on immigration so on this question of just potential negotiating strength that Britain would have on a bilateral basis uh, I wonder could you um, address that thank you um, well I mean I think you you summed it up very well look you know there's a trade-off um, yes being one country rather than um, having the Commission negotiate on behalf of 27 and having to make internal deals in order to get a negotiating position means we can be quicker and more flexible. We have fewer vested interests to defend. Um, we, uh, in particular, can be probably rather more liberal on not all, but lots of agricultural products. So that clearly makes it easier for us to do deals. On the other hand, uh, we're obviously not as, uh, not as powerful or as desirable. Uh, so how do those trade-offs balance out? Um, I think, uh, uh, um, you know, on China and India, frankly, the chances of any really far-reaching trade deal don't change very much, which is to say they weren't very large when we were part of the EU and they're not very large now. It's just too difficult. Uh, um, and these countries have their own quite strong vested interests and, and as you say, I mean, Theresa May has, has put India completely off the agenda for the foreseeable future because she doesn't like Indian immigrants. Um, you know, that, that, you know, sort of be quite blunt about it. Um, but even if we had a more liberal government approach to that, that wasn't so hung up on that particular question, um, you know, the 
Commission has been trying to negotiate with India for for quite a long time. And and you know, uh, you mentioned financial services. The Indians are very nervous about allowing UK financial services access to India for you know all sorts of complicate the usual complicated domestic political reasons. So I don't think that's going to happen. Um, I mean, I think that the big one for us is very much the U.S. and as the numbers, which I, I went probably too quickly for people to see, but the, for in terms of economic impacts, by far the biggest uh, issue for us is the U.S. Um, and there, I think the trade-offs are, you know, come into play. It is clearly easier for us in some respects to do deal with the U.S. Uh, than it is for the uh, EU. Equally, it's clear we, we'd get a worse deal because of the asymmetric negotiating weight. Um, is that, you know, and so how does that play in domestic British politics? Will, do we want to deal with the US enough to swallow hard? And swallow hard, I mean quite literally, since some of the most difficult issues for the British public is chlorinated chicken and hormone-treated beef. Um, uh, and we'll also have to accept that the idea that the U US is going to let us compete in financial services in New York, that's not going to happen. We know that the, the, the U.S. doesn't take that approach in terms of international negotiations on financial services. So we can probably, you know, so I think it's considerably more likely that a U.S.-U.K. trade deal will happen than, than, uh, uh, um, than TTIP in a shorter time period. But equally, it's going to be quite a, not going to be a great deal from the UK point of view, and it may well be that UK politics in the end derails it. So that those are those are the trade-offs of, of 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 leaving a large and powerful trade bloc. And final question to Alan Dukes. Thank you, Alan Dukes, a former politician. On on the trade area, um, I would think that the prospects of getting a reasonable trade agreement with the United States during the Trump. Uh, period is, is pretty much nil, um, and certainly the U.S. approach to any discussion will be very aggressive in terms of the products we're talking about. Uh, President Modi has said no trade deal unless you take more immigrants from, from India. Um, but the most enthusiastic one so far has been New Zealand. Um, but there's one firm in Ireland that does more business with the U.K. than the entire economy of New Zealand. Uh, so. We can't see any great uh, prospects there. Uh, but it seems to me that uh, there is some excessive pessimism about the UK's post-Brexit trade position with the rest of the world. Um, I proposed to another commentator some while ago that the UK should simply sit down with partners with which the EU already has a trade agreement and say, strike out EU and write in UK. Um, he poured cold water on that because he said, uh, well, it's not important enough for other countries uh, to do that. Uh, I would argue, however, they have nothing to lose by doing it. Um, and the WTO certainly couldn't um, oppose a move to, to lessen the impact on, on, on world trade. Um, in addition to which, the UK in some sectors already has a pretty unassailable position uh, in trade. If you take, for example, um, in the high-tech sectors, Rolls-Royce is specified equipment on large numbers of American aircraft now. So the Americans are not going to be nasty to the UK after they leave Brexit. And that trade, both in Europe and elsewhere, will be utterly unaffected. Um, so I'm not sure that the prospects for trade are as bleak as people sometimes put them. Um, where, where I am concerned is to... to to, feel, to, to know, is there any discussion in London about um, what would happen, uh, for example, to the Open Skies Agreement uh, within the European Union? We have the chief executive of our major airline saying the planes will stop flying the day after Brexit. Um, I think pigs will fly before the day the planes stop flying, given his motivation. But there is a complication there that will need to be ironed out, especially for, for British Airways, yeah. in which we have an interest. Um. I mean, on that last point, uh, um, yes, there is uh, uh, um, uh, considerable interest in open skies. And my assumption is that, that uh, um, unless we have the, the chaotic Brexit where there's no Article 50 deal at all, that there will be some form of, you know, that, that is one of the issues where it's not really in the interest of anyone to have complete breakdown, and therefore we will find some way of, of replicating most of what we currently have now. 
uh, uh, um, post Brexit. So my assumption is that that issue will be tied up. But I, I mean, you know, we you can't rule out that they would stop flying. I and mean, obviously, uh, um, Mr. O'Leary is not really going to want to stop flying. He's just sounding off. But if my Equally, my assumption is that if we actually exit without any deal at all, that, um, uh, um, that not the planes will physically have to stop flying, but that the lawyers will, you know, if the lawyers tell British Airways, actually, we do not know the legal status under which you're making this flight. Therefore, if something goes wrong with it, we don't know the extent to which your insurance will cover it, then they will stop flying, right? I mean, you don't, you wouldn't. And, and that is, you know, that and that writ large of, uh, across a whole range of economic relationships, this fear that we will not know the legal status of, of various contracts um, or various forms of economic activity is, is something that's very worrying about uh, a no deal or, or a not properly specified deal. But I, I th and, and that's another reason why I still don't think it's a likely outcome because it's so much a lose-lose proposition. We lose more than, than most other countries, but other countries lose quite a lot too. That no sane set of politicians is surely going to end another one. On the broader question about trade, I agree. You know, as I said, I don't think this is the end of the world. Uh, we will continue to trade with the EU, maybe less. We will continue to trade with the, the rest of the world, not as much more as some of the more zealous proponents of global free trade uh, 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 claim. On the copying and pasting existing agreements, um, Liam Fox said as much just a week ago that that's what the UK intends to do, um, and I suspect that is what we will. That you know, and that's another reason that we're actually these big new trade agreements with with the US, Indian, and China um, aren't going to happen anytime soon because actually the first priority will be to replicate uh, Korea and uh, CETA and maybe Japan and the uh, very and working out what to do with all the various, uh, um, gener what's not called the generalized system of preferences anymore, anything but arms, but the various other trade preferences we already have in place. Even that is not as simple as it sounds because, of course, rules of origin and accumulation can't simply be copied over. If we were to simply copy over the Korean trade agreement, um, you would that would interfere with the way that car production supply chains currently work. So even that wouldn't be good enough to preserve what we have now, as I understand it. Now, maybe that all can be sorted, but it, it's just another sort of expenditure of time and effort in order to get us back to where we were in the first place. Okay, apologies to people who uh, couldn't get in for, uh, for questions, but Jonathan has to uh, fly back shortly. Um, thank you for, for that. Covered uh, a lot of bases, and uh, certainly it was one of the less depressing <laughs> Brexit contributions we've had here recently. Thank you.